This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. William Presley, who is a professor emeritus at the University of Maryland uh, and has previously taught at Yale, University of Texas at Austin, and Duke University. Uh, at the University of Maryland, he served as the Director of Graduate Studies and Chair of the Department of Art History and Archaeology. Uh, he's written at least five books that I found, as well as two uh, exhibition catalogs, uh, mostly on British painters and paintings, uh, as well as numerous other publications and articles on the likes of William uh, 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 Blake, uh, John Singleton Copley, and perhaps most known to numismatists of U.S. material, Gilbert Stewart. Uh, he has earned many awards and even was once a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, where our esteemed now former executive director, Gio Bronsberg, is studying. Uh, today, he will be presenting on his most recent publication, uh, America's Paper Money, a Canvas for an Emerging Nation. So, uh, Dr. Presley, I hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Jesse. I appreciate it. And I want to thank both you and uh, Emma for all your help and uh, through the last few months and in, in getting this ready. And I appreciate the invitation to, to give this talk. And it's sort of nice to be able to address people who are interested in, in this subject. Um, as the introduction suggested, I'm an art historian, uh, but I do come by uh, the study of uh, paper money legitimately, because this, this was a uh, passion of mine is, is when I was a kid. Uh, my first piece of paper money I bought uh, when I was 11 years old. And I grew up in Atlanta, is where I now retire. And uh, unsurprisingly, that uh, piece of money was uh, Confederate money. Um, and uh, I collected off and on ever since. Um, and so I'm, I am for familiar with the collecting world. And what has always is struck me uh, is how remarkable the imagery is on so much of, of the paper money. And the art history world and the, the world of numismatics, um, they're entirely separate. And that, that's, I, I think, uh, um, a great loss to, to both. And as for art historians, the, the problem has been, from my point of view, is that they're stuck up as hell. Uh, they consider this as beneath their notice. Uh, this is material culture. Uh, it has to do with commerce. And uh, they're not all that interested. And I think uh, we've been missing out on something that this really is an art form. Um, and I hope my book can, can make that case. Um, as for the numismatists, I think the problem has been that they have not fully appreciated the context in which this money was created. And that's something that I'm, I've uh, tried to do is to see that uh, there's a lot more going on here and it has a lot richer and deeper tradition uh, that, than we have um, uh, really been uh, aware of. And I thought about going through the book chronologically, but I just threw that up in the air and said, what the hell? And so we're just going to go uh, through some things that um, have uh, interested me and uh, I hope they'll, they'll prove of interest. And I'll try to, to be as short as I can so we can have some uh, question and answer uh, afterwards. But this is, um, oh boy, the... <laughs> Yeah, technology in me, we, we don't agree. So I can't get the uh, um, image to move. Any way we can get on to the, uh, uh, Jesse or, or Emma, can you suggest yeah, how? Try try clicking the, uh, the, the title page there and then using the arrows on your screen. Ah, okay. 
Thank you. Yes, it's very simple and uh, couldn't do it. Um, so just starting, this is a note that appears on the, the uh, cover of the book. Uh, and the subtitle of the book, well, the book's title is America's Paper Money, and it's the paper money from the very beginning, 1690, which is actually the first paper money produced by a government in the Western world. And that's the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And on that, their very first notes, they did have visual imagery. Um, and so you have uh, colonial and continental currency, and then the banknotes of, of the 19th century. And my subtitle to, to the um, uh, book is uh, An Emerging Nations uh, I'm sorry, a canvas for an emerging nation. So this is is the way I want to see it, is I think the way that, that a lot of these uh, engravers and artists saw it, uh, that they were really embodying and depicting America. And our sense of America comes from these images and they're our self-identity. Um, and this, in fact... Uh, is the most widespread images of the country um, that we have. I mean, people in the 19th century talk about Courier and Ives prints and how they're so much Americana. But if you really want to see uh, how people are, are thinking about the country, uh, I think looking to, to paper money imagery is, is a good way to do it. Um, so here... We see the Bank of the Commonwealth in uh, New York. Uh, it was actually in New York City, and it's dated May 5th, 1853. And what basically you have, this the, the note becomes a canvas. The, the, the uh, imagery fills it entirely. Um, and so you'd have these individual vignettes, but over time, the vignettes got bigger and bigger, um, uh, and they did become canvases depicting the nation. This is very inventive, very in imaginative, because it takes individual vignettes and then incorporates them into the, this uh, fantastic whole. And you can almost see it as, as a map of... Um, uh, New York State. I mean, this is the Commonwealth of New York that we're looking at. And in the upper left is Niagara Falls. Uh, and then we've got the trains coming out of the west and through the mountain tunnels and on. In the center, you've got Milkmaid, sort of a, a traditional uh, vignette and the, this pastoral uh, landscape that unfolds. And it's sort of framed by the two small trees on either side. And then the Erie Canal stretches across the background and it's connecting uh, uh, Niagara Falls and Lake Erie. Uh, and you can see some of the canal boats and it goes by the, the it's cut off a bit, but it, in the uh, upper right, you can see the, the Albany and uh, we, we're losing New York Harbor, unfortunately, down here on, on, on the right. Um, but there is a, a steamboat in the harbor that's Mark Fulton. Uh, you've got the Palisades there in the background, which link up the Hudson River to the Erie Canal. And all of this spills out into a, a very uh, busy scene of New York Harbor. And just the, the um, uh, numeral five, which we're only seeing a part of it, that covers the entire right-hand side, I think is, is uh, brilliantly done. Um, and this is the uh, work, I, I am guessing, uh, I think there's very good evidence for it. You can't prove it 100%, but John W. Casalier. Uh, who was also a landscape artist as well as a banknote engraver, and I, I think uh, quite a, an, an excellent engraver. 
And then we have someone like W.L. Ormsby, um, and he, he had his, his uh, idea of the unit system where um, every note was to be a picture. So a picture that filled the, the uh, entire uh, uh, canvas, uh, as it were. And uh, he wanted the sort of the lettering, the, the information pushed to the margins, made unusually uh, small, and uh, I think very successful in sort of creating for uh, Leavenworth and uh, the ter territory of Kansas at that time, uh, this really a Virgilian image, a pastoral image uh, here in, in America's Hartman. And as the talk goes on, you'll see I'm a big fan of uh, W.L. Ormsby. He was a son of a bitch, uh, very prickly, difficult to get along with. The U.S. government just wanted to do business with him later on. Uh, but he was a remarkable man. He's also a bad engraver. The quality of engraving we've got this blown up is not all that technically proficient. But he had ideas, um, and that's something that I, I very much uh, admire about him. Um, and another issue that we want to take up is not just how the uh, notes became a, a uh, canvas and are uh, mapping out an a, uh, entire country, but this kind of image that we're looking at here, which is coming from high art, this is academic art. This is the European convention. And this is the, uh, the, the uh, mode in which all the artists in the 19th century were trained in. So they looked at the old masters and they turned to the old masters for subject matter. And this comes out of Guido Rainey's uh, the the uh, chariot of Apollo. So you see Apollo, the sun god, who is uh, here in his chariot with his lyre at his side and now uh, moving uh, across the, the uh, skies. And there have been uh, some who've criticized this, this, this whole approach. Uh, what in the world does this kind of subject matter have to do with the United States and, and the the uh, American experience, and so th this is, uh, uh, in their opinion, uh, uh, ridiculous that it uh, should show up on on uh, paper money. And I'm quoting uh, Richard Dotty in in his book on on um, uh, bank notes uh, that he talks uh, uh, about the disjuncture between the high-mindedness of a subject and the inherent nature of the note upon which it appears, which after all is money, pure and simple. Um, and in the case of this very note, he says he dismisses it as containing horses, levitating deities, and a cherub thrown in for good measure. So it's easy to sort of uh, make fun of, of uh, these kinds of uh, high-minded esoteric subjects, but I think they're absolutely about the American experience and how Americans adapted this uh, to, to our culture. And uh, this high-mindedness too, the, the, uh, it gives a, uh, a, a, a sense of, uh, propriety and dignity, uh, gravity to, to the uh, banks. It sort of fosters a confidence in, in uh, what they're doing. But I think it's very relevant to, to uh, in this case, Ann Arbor, Michigan. You've got Apollo on the left-hand side, because this is, is uh, it doesn't copy Guido Rainey. It, it, it uh, is, is sort of based on that. But that's uh, it's the four seasons around Apollo, that spring, then in the middle of summer, and then comes fall. And then there in the backgrounds are almost the, the head behind 
Apollo is winter, sort of the, the dead time of, of year. And Apollo is, this is the dawn. And you see the dawn breaking there and the cherub is with the lighted torch is, is leading the way. And people actually talked about in, in America uh, about this imagery and how it applies uh, to, to America. You know, this is a, a, a speech that was given in 1815, um, and it talks about the disappearance of the indigenous Americans uh, before the onslaught of Western civilization. So he talks about the sublime allegorical painting of Vito in the Apollo, um, chasing night and her shadows over the surface of the globe. And for him, this is an allusion, and I'm quoting, to the extinction of our savage precursors before the dawn of science and cultivation. So this moving um, westward, the sun uh, is not only for a rural farming community, uh, certainly very apt, but it's the rolling back of superstition and savagery and the introduction into America of civilization. Um, and this goes back to an old trope that we'll come uh, uh, mention later on too, of how civilization advances westward and is very popular in Europe. It starts in the Middle East. Uh, often people will say Egypt, and then it goes to Europe but now the, the, the sun has continued on and it's, it's uh, gone further west now to American, uh, America shores. And uh, this, what had been a benighted culture is, is now uh, be going to become a civilized one. Of course, turned from the uh, white uh, American point of view. Um, or this powerful image, uh, which appeared in 1779 by Thomas Coram. And this is the $70 bill for, for the um, state of South Carolina. And it's a marvelous note, again, that fills, this is the back of the note, that fills the, the uh, uh, entire uh, space of the note. And uh, it's, it's revolutionary propaganda. Uh, the figure that we see here is Prometheus. He's chained to a rock and he's uh, tortured that an eagle comes each day and plucks out and eats his liver. And uh, the liver re rejuvenates. And so the next day, this painful ordeal begins all over again. And this is his punishment for having stolen fire from the gods for mankind. And uh, of course, though Hercules eventually frees Prometheus. So this, this is, is about resurrection and salvation, ultimately that this uh, beast that is Acting away at, at uh, a uh, chained America is is going to ultimately be vanquished by America's indomitable spirit. Now, this uh, um, Coram was born in 1756, so he's only 23 years old uh, when he does this, and it's one of three notes. The others, I think, have to do with Hercules as well, and so they they all have a, have a uh, uh, a pattern. Uh, but you can see uh, that this has to do uh, with a print that uh, Coram was copying. So that's the basis of his design. And just like the earlier image we saw based on Guido Reni, they look back to the old masters. And this is actually a uh, an image, a drawing created by Michelangelo. And the print on the right-hand side uh, is um, from 1542 by Nicholas Biatrizet. And uh, so Coram would have seen this print. Uh, the, the, the teacher that he had in Charleston had been to Europe and I think would have brought back some of these things. 
Um, and the print, though, actually shows uh, the vulture, Hytius, uh, I'm sorry, the vulture uh, uh, taking the liver of Hytius. Um, and Hytius is a evil god. Uh, and this has to do if, with Michelangelo, with Neoplatonic values and, and the punishment of the wicked and so on. Uh, but then Coram takes it over. And it is, for me, everyone's called this Prometheus. It, it's not Titius at this point. It is Prometheus. Uh, it, it, uh, again, how you can transform uh, the the uh, message that that you uh, take from from the old masters, and uh, it's interesting to me here to me too that the Michelangelo drawing and the print after it. By the way, all that background and the print was not in Michelangelo's drawing. It's just the figure of of the the vulture and um, the god um, that. Uh, these lost my train of thought. I'm getting old. That oh, the, that uh, the, the Michelangelo and the print show uh, Titius's male genitalia. You can't do that in America, and it wouldn't be appropriate on paper money. So we do have this big uh, flap that uh, uh, comes over Prometheus's genitalia in, in the uh, uh, note. Uh, here's another example of a um, looking to, to classical sources. And I should say, this is America. Uh, America has Christian values. Uh, and we'll talk about how can those be shown in banknotes because you can't serve two masters can't serve both God and mammon. You can't get more mammon than money. But uh, Christian values come up here in, in the money as well. But there is this classical tradition. I mean, our government is based on the Roman Republic. We have a Senate. Uh, and the fact that we're a republic, I mean, it's we, we uh, are steeped in, in uh, uh, the uh, classical background in the, the birth of our country. And so all of this is about as American as, as uh, you, you can want to get. And here, uh, this is a vignette on the, the uh, lower left-hand side by Freeman Rodden. And he's one of the, the um, uh, partners of uh, Rodden, Wright, and Hatch, which went on to become as Rodden, Wright, Hatch, and Edson, the, the uh, biggest of the banknote companies before the mer merger into the American banknote company. And this states to 1834, although the note is 1840, um, and it shows uh, the birth of Venus. So he's taking a, a, a high-minded classical subject that he, he uh, wants to produce, and he actually signs the vignette. And for 1834, that's somewhat unusual. You have Asher B. Duran earlier signing things, uh, but uh, by the 1830s, it's more of a corporate enterprise and people aren't signing their vignettes, but he does do that. Um, except he too uh, goes to the old masters and looking for, for a... a uh, source. And again, what's utterly fascinating here is are the differences uh, between the two sources. What you're seeing on the right-hand side is the uh, birth of Venus by an Irish artist named James Barry. And Barry uh, worked in, in um, London. Um, and uh, this is a mezzo tent. Because I'm showing you prints because that's how they would have been seen in America. There's no way Freeman Rodden could ever have seen the painting, but he would have known the Matsutin. Um, And uh, Barry exhibited the painting in, in, uh, at the Royal Academy in London in uh, 1772. 
And Valentine Green's Metsa tent after it was done in the, the same year. So this is the birth of Venus. She is uh, coming up out of the uh, ocean seahorses and sort of a whale-like monster at her feet. Um, flowers spring up at her feet as she steps onto the shore. And you can see in the berry what's happening is that the um, uh, Cupid, who's accompanying uh, Venus, uh, he's mischievously shot his arrow. The arrow has just been fired and he's looking at us. So you, the viewer, when you're standing in front of this, the arrow is going uh, into your heart. Uh, so when you fall in love, but not in a carnal way, you fall, this is again Neoplatonic. This is about a uh, idealized beauty that, that one is lifted up and, and uh, uh, can, is, is, is uh, thrilled by. But what does Fried, Freeman Rodden do? He takes that Cupid and turns it into Mercury. And uh, the figure, Mercury's holding his uh, caduceus. He's got a money bag in his right hand. Uh, Cupid's wings have become drapery. He actually puts, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, uh, yeah, here, I uh, hope this works. But that's um, the... the uh, uh, God Neptune riding on, on a uh, chariot. There's a mast of a ship, which we can't see in this reproduction. Here, where there were the doves, we've got a, a woman in a chariot with a star over her head. That's the morning star, which is Venus again. But what this becomes is an image about maritime trade, the birth of of uh, a new maritime partner in the world, which is the United States of America. So this is, is paying homage, homage to commerce on the high seas. And it gets very complicated. And uh, I should say this with every image in, that I'm showing, go read it in the book, but there's a lot about there about how in Americanizing this and making it about commerce, uh, things get a little dicey. I mean, uh, uh, Venus, the goddess of love, or is Venus here more uh, uh, the, uh, a prostitute? Because Venus is another word for, for prostitute. But commerce and high art, uh, it starts to, to, to get, uh, 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 we're on uh, somewhat shaky ground. Um, and just just for the, 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 the nothing to do with the Freeman Rod or the banknote, but the Barry image was known. It was around. And the, this is um, a uh, painting by uh, Raphael Peel of Venus rising from the de sea of deception that you see on the right-hand side. And I hope you can make out you know, the hair here, the foot down here, it's Barry's Venus. But he chooses to paint it with a cover over it, pinned up. And he signs uh, his canvas here on this cloth that's covering it. Covering it. And again, this this is a, uh, a battle about... Uh, um, what's appropriate in American art and what isn't. Barry and the old masters in Europe are allowed to paint nudes. Uh, American artists have a very hard time doing that. And so all he can do is paint a, a, a cover-up. Uh, this was done about 1822. He committed suicide in 1827. Uh, the Freeman Rodden comes out in, in 1834. So uh, these are kind of close together. I do think Freeman Rodden would have known of this work. Uh, I mean, appeals a Philadelphia artist, but that's uh, not terribly important. Or we, we can talk about, um, uh, again, allegory 
mixed with everyday scenes. And uh, the, I think this wonderful uh, uh, note from um, the late 1850s uh, showing a landscape over here, the farmhouse and, and uh, cattle and sheep, then the, the river coming through and falling. And again, of course, it's it's a very imaginative construct because no waterfall is going to be quite that high. But then down below uh, the river, but uh, it's more about uh, commerce and, and uh, urban uh, settings. But juxtapose on that is this wonderful allegorical figure. Uh, again, oh, this is my cat. Thomas, who just went by, um, and it's uh, holding the, the, uh, an image of peace and plenty. Uh, one reader of this in one of the, the uh, Bankner catalogs say it's a woman standing at the edge of a cliff. Well, she is. A, uh oh, can I please go? I'm going to uh, invite the cat out. He's starting to walk on the, the key, excuse me. Uh, come on. He didn't follow me, so I'll try. Um, so and there's a breeze that goes right through the mill, and so, so the, the very title itself captures that breeze and sort of undulating through. And then we have a realistic scene, semi-realistic, of the uh, corn gatherer over here on, on uh, uh, this side. Yeah. Then we've got, uh, there are lots of images, particularly portraits of George Washington and a, a very strong banknote iconography there, the father of the country. But you you can see a real figure in quotation marks placed with an allegorical figure. This is uh, again about the, the American Revolution. Washington is getting money from the bank uh, to help supply his troops, which we see the encampment there in, in the uh, uh, left background. Uh, but, I mean, imagine a scene, of, a realistic scene of uh, Washington approaching the teller's window or sitting at the desk with the bank president, uh, this doing allegory and, and uh, with an equestrian portrait of Washington on horseback, I think, uh, works much better. Um, and now, we, this is the kind of image I love. I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a problem uh, picture. I mean, it's very, very complicated. What in the world are we looking at? Uh, it's also unique. I think it may be the it was found in, in the bank vault of the Carroll County Bank, and it's now owned by uh, Q. David Bowers. And I think nobody knew quite what to do with it. Um, the, the bank president, I should think, so it, it, it was uh, never circulated. But this uh, rather remarkable scene uh, where we have the, the two main figures here, she has a laurel crown, she also has a compass in the globe, navigation. Um, and this interesting figure is uh, pointing out uh, the, the scene here on the right-hand side. And the arm is taken right out of Michelangelo again, and that's, that comes off the uh, ceiling of, of the Sistine Chapel of God the Father, an image of creation. Um, and what we have on the left is uh, a scene of, of America, and we know because it's Indians and, and the, the uh, uh, quiver in the bow that are hanging from the tree. Um, Bowers 
call this a, a bust of Washington. It's not. It's the bust of Shakespeare. Uh, and what we're looking at here, these are the European arts, so Shakespeare and writing. We've got the mallet of, of a sculpture, the, the uh, palette and brushes of, of uh, painting. And so through navigation, the arts have found their way to America. And from this uh, now uh, blossoming in, in the new world is going to come here on the right-hand side, ultimately a, a, a splendid um, uh, brand new world of industry and ships and, and, and all. But who in the world is this uh, winged figure? And we do have a, a, a statement made by Stephen Bede, who was the cashier of the Carroll County Bank, and he described it as an Egyptian with wings. And if that's the case, we, we have again the uh, story of the Western migration of um, civilization starting in Egypt, flourishes then in Europe, then all this brought to America's shore, and we're going to have this brand new world. Personally, I'm more inclined. It doesn't change the meaning. It's still still all there. But uh, I see this sort of sun headdress. It looks more Aztec to me. Um, I think it's a, an indigenous American. But again, it's an allegorical figure since it has uh, wings, and uh, but representing the new promise of, of America. It's still basically the same uh, uh, idea as, as the earlier. Um, this is uh, a specimen sheet by Ormsby that he put out, and he's trying to, to uh, advertise his kaleidograph, uh, which all these intricate machine-made uh, counters that we see here uh, the date is 1855, and uh, security. This is what this is about, that the, these kinds of technological advances are creating a, a um, uh, new security for, for uh, uh, the banknotes that are disseminated. It's against counterfeiting across the uh, country. This, of course, neglects the, to mention that a lot of the money being produced by the banknote engraving firms are worthless. Uh, they're fraudulent. And how the whole economic structure uh, survived as long as it did, I have no idea. That'll leave to the economists. Uh, but what you have here, I'm, and Hornsby used this vignette on banknotes and he used it on a $5 bill, uh, just as you see here with five cupids. But what we're really looking at, if you step back, this is a roulette wheel. There's no security here. It's the wheel of fortune. And sometimes you're coming up and go, you're at the top. And then you go down, and when the wheel of fortune spins round and round, um, and this is the, the 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 two images down here remind me of the two hemispheres of the world, uh, a map of the world, and um, so love is uh, perhaps the the the, the uh, primary thing, but it's really the love of money. Um, and uh, it can get us into to a, uh, a lot of trouble. Again, Ormsby being very clever, uh, I don't think this message, though, would have been lost on, on his contemporaries. Another reason uh, of his contemporary banknote engravers, the firms, another reason he was not uh, very popular with them, but he's telling it like it is. Or these images of, of uh, transportation in America that's, that's on the move. 
Uh, here we've got the, the riverboat, we've got the uh, paddle wheeler, we've got the train, 76, the spirit of 76. We've got a canal boat down here, uh, very much a masculine world. Then you get images like this that often appear on notes and they are in at this time are called uh, fancy heads. And they're not portraits. And sometimes we know who the sitter was, but that's not what it's about. It's, it's about an idealized image of um, womanhood that, that we are, are seeing. And they can appear on different notes. Um, this same woman here, again, in the lower right-hand corner, a wonderful topographical scene of the square in, in um, uh, Northampton. Uh, and I'll just stop here to, just to comment that uh, how religion does play such an important role in American life. And we see the, the um, emphasized here with the two churches and you can say, well, look, uh, it's the town that's emphasizing religion, not the the banknote engraver. But it does interest me, and you get this a lot of these little details, that the spire here as we go up, we've got this heavy black border and that spire breaks through and opens up to the larger spiritual world above. And so there, there are often these hints of, uh, about uh, uh, religion. Or take this uh, note, which is, the center vignette here, another fancy head on the left. Uh, the vignette here is is by uh, John W. Castellier. And uh, it again shows America's promise of pastoral setting. But this is straight out of the Bible, just like we had those classical references uh, in so many of the notes. This is a deliberate biblical reference. And the... Um, when you get a, 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 a proof of just the vignette, it's entitled Rebecca. And this is Rebecca at the well out of the Old Testament. It appears in, in the book of, of Genesis. And it's the story of Rebecca who's um, pouring water from a well into a trough uh, so that camels can drink. Well, he's changed that to sheep to make it suitable to, to an American um, locale. But she, the, the, the figure, the woman, is in sort of pseudo-biblical clothing. That is not contemporary attire for a uh, rustic uh, American female. So the, these biblical images are, are uh, surfacing in, in uh, uh, subtle ways. Or the, here, again, very crudely done, but I think an important image to show America's place in the world, the Globe Bank. And the globe is on Atlas's shoulders. And what we have here on, on top of the globe, those are the four continents. And we've sort of lost touch with that. But in the, the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, and actually well in the 20th century, the four continents is a, a common trope, even after other continents were discovered, um, still maintained. These are the four major ones. And you have America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Uh, those are the four continents. And America is seen... Um, I mean, it can stand in for, so it can be for the United States. It can be stand for the continent of America. And in, in the terms of the four continents, North and South America are seen as America. And that's still true in some South American uh, countries. They do not consider North America a separate continent from South America. They are one continent. At any rate, uh, it, it is, America has joined the other continents, but she's holding a shield 
uh, of the United States. So she stands in for the whole of America, North and South America, but very specifically also the, the uh, United States and its importance in the world. And Europe is the companion one who uh, sort of shares that upper position with her and puts her hand on her shoulder and looks to her. And of course, we have history down below who's recording America's history and as Father Time uh, looks on. Or then in terms of, of um, the whole chapter on uh, Indians, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm running too late. Um, and uh, we've, we've got the Indians on the left compared to, to the uh, settlers on the right. We're missing that. Uh, but the settlers have the wild beasts of, of, of strong of, of the ox have been tamed. Here, though, we have the great savage confrontation with the buffalo. But all of this is a meditation on that's the, the state seal of, of the uh, uh, state of, uh, of um, Indiana. Or here, the idea of the vanishing Indian, the Indian that's disappearing, and the uh, uh, nostalgia that Americans feel. Uh, for for this uh, lost frontier, uh, and it comes through in a, a lot of the imagery. This is a typical one of sort of the stoic native brave with his family. They're looking out on a promontory, and you can see the encroachment of Western civilization, of white culture, as it's moving across America and displacing them. And I think this has been misread. Um, Heinz Teschler, uh, a German who, who writes about American painting uh, paper money, says the pointing gesture of the wife urging her husband to join the white man's culture, he names it the era of their way of life opus. So she is saying, look, this is what we need to join. That's not what's happening. If you look at the uh, uh, 19th century discussions about the American Indian, uh, it's remarked on, particularly by de Tocqueville um, in his book on America, that Americans, American Indians and the whites had been together for over 200 years, and yet the Indians chose not to take one thing from white culture. And this is a, a visual device instead. I mean, she he's here lost and brooding in his thoughts, but she is like saying, here, see, this is what he's thinking on. Uh, she's not a renegade to, to her, her, her own uh, culture. And I'll go real fast now. We've, we've got... Um, uh, the National Bank notes there's so much to say uh, about this that wonderful series. And here you've you've got the five dollar bill, the first initially in the series. and the on the back of all these notes, and this is the front and back of the same bill. Uh, the back is, is uh, appearing smaller than the front when uh, they're side by side here. Um, but it's the only one because they take seven of the, the uh, uh, paintings that are in the rotunda and uh, put them um, uh, on the backs of, of the bills. And very quickly, the front of the bills and the back of the bills become disjointed. Uh, what I argue, though, that there is a method to their madness, uh, that they are more... Uh, um, join than, than previously thought that you have two tracks that are running parallel uh, chronologically. The paintings uh, on the back are, are run chronologically and the painting, the vignettes on the front run chronologically. Now they, they may not be in sync, uh, but they're all uh, pursuing a chronological path. Uh, here we've got Columbus uh, seeing the, spotting the new world. Then on the back is his landing in the new world, the Vanderlyn painting. 
And then on the front, uh, this is a um, vignette by uh, Theodore Liebler, and it's been called Pocahontas presented at court. So the Indian princess, this is Colum uh, Columbus, well, uh, she's being old, I guess, and uh, I mean, Columbus and Pocahontas could never, they could not live at the same time, but presented at court. And of course, what we have here, it's the four continents again. Uh, so this is Columbus. He's presenting the continent of America to the continents of Europe, Asia, and Africa. So it's the four continents uh, that Liebler is, is showing, and we've lost touch with, with sort of these earlier um, uh, um, easily recognized uh, uh, scenes for 19th century viewers. Uh, this was done by, by uh, Ormsby's uh, publication house, the, the uh, Continental Banknote Company, and in a letter to the Secretary Chase of the, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, he said, I have carried the Continental Banknote Company through their contract for fives, this $5 note, on the unit system, my invention. So he's claiming this, again, is the unit system where the entire uh, ground of, of the banknote is filled up with images. And I think that's true here. If you take the back into account with the front, Washington points into the note the, to the landing. On the back is the landing. So you go down here and then you come up again as he strides forward and introduces America to, to uh, uh, the larger world. Um, I'm skipping, skipping. Oh, I love this because it's it's such a uh, interesting, uh, terrible, terrible in terms of the quality of its execution. But I'm fascinated by the subject matter. I'll just go to, the, to, to forget the one. It was fascinating what was going on in that one. But uh, at any rate, um, here we've we've got the first time the Confederate soldiers appear on a Confederate note. Um, and these two soldiers here at the, the lower left. This is 1862. Only one other time the soldiers appear, and that's in a note of 1864, the $10 note. Um, and I've screwed up again in trying to get to the next one. I, you know, everything is, is off. There we go. So you can see that the, the this has been taken straight out of a banknote vignette, and these are Revolutionary War soldiers. And you can, you if you don't believe this is a based on on this, look down below them. And they've taken over literally the, the that composition, but this this is a deliberate harking back on the part of the Confederacy to the spirit of 1776, and that they are the ones who brought forth that spirit, that the, the uh, North has lost it, has become mercantile, and they are, are the, the uh, true things. And I'll end with this. Uh, here we, we've got the, the um, uh, silver certificate, which I think is the high watermark of federal paper money, this image of, of um, uh, 1896. Um, and it's showing, uh, again, a little difficult, I think, for the contemporary artist to follow it. But this figure of liberty, like the Statue of Liberty holding a beacon, but in this of light, but in this case, it's a light bulb. And Thomas Edison is uh, sort of there in this ribbon that comes down, touches the uh, bolt of lightning from the classical god in his chariot, an allusion to Benjamin Franklin and America's importance in developing electricity. Uh, her figure is uh, based on the wing victory, a classical sculpture. This is fame uh, with her trumpet. 
uh, this figure rises up, peace, with, again, these wonderful uh, ribbon held by the dove, which matches some of the thunderbolts, uh, the U.S. Capitol behind, surely the Constitution here, the American Eagle, and again, the classical uh, chariot. This is Apollo with the, the uh, um, thunder and lightning, uh, but it's also, uh, I'm sorry, Jupiter, but it's also Apollo in terms of the youth and the uh, laurel crown. Uh, the uh, chariot, by the way, is clouds. All of this is, is uh, clouds, and even the rains are lightning bolts. So, a, a fantastic figure, uh, a image by Walter Shearlaw, who is a an artist. He started as a banknote engraver, but became an artist. And here, the federal government, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, went to to um, seek out the help of, of uh, known artists. And I think it was enormously successful, in my opinion. Uh, not everyone uh, agrees, uh, particularly the engravers of the Bureau Engraving and Printing, printing uh, were quite mad about it the, the, the whole time. And the whole thing is this bravura performance. We have a proscenium arch here. And it, it's sort of this Baroque splendor of this uh, figure, this, these uh, images uh, burst, burst uh, forth. And um, I just don't know how you could do better in summing up the spirit of America and what it means and this coming out of the classical past and building on these foundations and creating a, a new world, American exceptionalism. There's nothing like this uh, yet seen on the face of the earth. Uh, we are also the new holy land, the promised land, as we saw in some of those religious images. And if you could just bear one moment, um, an artist, uh, Charles Sheen, was very mad with this kind of art. And he said, the future, right at this time, the future great art of this republic will be primarily a recording art. It will be simple, virile, and direct. It will have emancipated itself from supernatural figures, that is, allegorical figures. It will speak with no foreign accent, that's the academic tradition from Europe, nor be encumbered with the theatrical properties of the schools. Except as they personify the ideals of the people, it will not need for its expression the tiresome collections of classical paraphernalia, fame with her trumpet, the winged victory, the laurel crown and the palm of victory will fade and vanish away. Of course, I'm in the other camp. I think that's totally wrong. I think this absolutely does a uh, fantastic uh, image of, of, of embodying the, the uh, American spirit. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll stop here um, much too long. Thank you so much, Dr. Presley. If you click on the very top of your screen, it should say stop sharing and that will allow everyone to be seen once again. All Thank right. Uh, yeah. Before we get to one or two questions, I would like to honor everyone with a free version of the book. Uh, it's in the chat, uh, compliment to the INS. And, uh, and in actuality, uh, your book is free by download only. That's the only way that has been published, if I'm not mistaken, through. That's uh, right. I, I do have some printed copies. OK, yeah. Um, but which, uh, no, uh, I think that's that's uh, an amazing development in publications. Um, right. But it, it is only available online to the general. Yeah, no, it's amazing. So we all appreciate that. Uh, so anyone who is here can click in the chat and and download the entire book for free. Uh, I'm going to open it up for questions and automatically go to Mark Tomasco because I know he's dying to ask a question. So Mark, oh Mark, I will you see you there. Uh, yeah, I in the beginning uh, I had wanted to thank so many people in in the collecting community that have been so helpful. Uh, Mark was one, the primary one. He read the manuscript. He wrote the foreword to the book, which for which I'm very uh, grateful. And uh, 
uh, uh, Lynn Augsburger, who I think is there today, uh, he also was was very uh, helpful as as many others. It, it really was a, a wonderful community. And uh, thanks to Mark too, Yale University Art Gallery is doing a lot with um, uh, printed money and and uh, it deserves to be in an art gallery. That's that's one of my uh, arguments and one of Mark's arguments. I hope I could speak for him. Sorry, Mark, <laughs> I haven't left you much time. Absolutely. It was fascinating, Bill, as usual, but the uh, the interesting comment you made about uh, Ormsby, um, Ormsby was a very creative, talented gentleman, but he was not a great engraver. If you notice those cows on the Car uh, the Carroll County, not Carroll County, the uh, first one you showed. Yeah, that's Leavenworth. All, that's all etching. He was oh, okay. pretty okay. good at etching, but his faces on the Carroll County, if you look at those faces, they're not great. Uh, so, But it's an interesting contrast um, in terms of he was a creative man, to put it mildly. But your your look and the part that I really appreciate is that to have an art historian really look at these images and give some of the classical background is wonderful. And that's what the book really is outstanding on. And even the national currency where you're showing the progression uh, on the $5 note uh, is very interesting. So thank you for bringing this information out. Well, thank you, Mark, again, for, for your help and uh, letting me get, uh, having to make this a reality. I do appreciate because, uh, you know, there, the there's a lot the of sophisticated technology going on here, which uh, I was in over my head and without Mark uh, leading me through this wilderness, uh, I, I would have been lost. It's a shame the book is not available more in print and just online. And online free is wonderful, but uh, the book in print is really um, what should be available. So, Jesse, I don't find it a wonderful system, but <laughs> <that's>... <laughs> well, it, may, it makes it more uh, you know accessible. So accessible. You're that. right. You're yeah. right on that score. Uh, there's, there is nothing like holding a book, but the accessibility is is quite astounding. But also uh, reference, for reference purposes, uh, the printed book. But anyway, go ahead. Others should ask. Yeah, if there's any other questions, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we're a little bit over time, but we don't mind, you know, if there's anyone, uh, you know, uh, hoping to ask something for to Dr. Presley right now, uh, you're more than welcome to unmute yourselves and ask um, we also can put it into the chat. Uh, we have uh, Larry Schwimmer. Why was C-19 U.S. so comfortable with female nudity, but later uh, 20th century objected to much more minor depictions? Uh, well, it's always been a factor. And um, I was interested, too, in, in reading uh, people commenting in the late 20th century on an image like uh, that that we saw of the birth of Venus, they called it uh, semi-pornographic. And that it's not. And there is a, with academic art, there's a difference uh, between the nude and the naked. Um, and I'm going to use Kenneth Clark, the, the uh, English art historian's easy definition of the difference. A naked person is someone who's taken off their clothes. A nude person is uh, someone of that state is the natural state. And for Venus, uh, it, it is. But even in, you know, in the 19th century, they, it, it was a bit problematic. And, and we saw with, with uh, uh, poor... Uh, Raphael Peel that he had to do a painting covering up Barry's painting. So, so there was always that tension going on. If anything, I think we've gotten worse. What? Who? We got, it, it's in the book and a footnote, but there was a member of uh, um, uh, Bush's, the second Bush W's uh, cabinet who. Uh, the Department of Justice 
put cloth over the bare-breasted uh, statue of, of uh, justice when he gave this uh, speech about uh, 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 there in that hall. I mean, it's to me, it's just amazing. Um, thank you, Larry, for the question. And uh, if there's any other questions, um, if not, I think uh, this is a good time to wrap it up. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Presley, for an amazing uh, talk and discussion. And uh, again, if uh, before we close the, the uh, Zoom, if you want to click that link and download the book for free, there it is for you. And, um, uh, you know, hit, hit, hit print on your printer so that you can follow Mark's uh, uh, lead and, and have one in uh, hardbound, too. So uh, I should I should mention that the book isn't free. You've already paid for it. Um, yeah, yeah. because it's your tax dollars hey. that uh, <laughs> enable the Smith Smithsonian to put it out there. Well, thank so, you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, and you're <laughs> welcome. So, uh, well, thank you all.